This is part 2 in a tutorial trilogy I'm making, but you don't need to have watched part 1 to follow along, each of these are independent videos. Today I'll teach you how to make a more sophisticated sorting visualizer. It has a 3D perspective and we animate the transitions as well. Oh, there's a melody playing this time too. We'll code everything from scratch using vanilla JavaScript and HTML canvas. And I'm gonna focus on the animation technique this time. So by the end of this video, I'll turn you in uh, some sort of an artist as well. Get it? Some sort? Because we're gonna... No, 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 no. Gonna code, debug and have fun. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Gonna prototype and design. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Let's code now. We'll begin with basic HTML. In the head, I'm going to define the title and um, link an external CSS file like this. We'll need to create this in a moment. In the body, I'm going to write the title as well to see it in the page. And I'm going to use a canvas this time. And I'll call it my canvas like this. Then I'll also include the JavaScript file here where we'll write most of the code. Okay, let's create these new files like this, style CSS, script JS, and we'll be sorting a 20 element array. So let's set n is equal to 20 here and define the array like this. And I'm going to populate this array with random values between 0 and 1. This is what the math.random function gives us. Let's log this to see if what we have at the moment works and uh, refresh the page. And we see here sorting visualizer appearing in the tab and also on the page in the h1 tag and this array of 20 different items with values from zero to one randomly generated. Great. Now I'm gonna visualize these values as columns. I'm gonna draw these columns on the canvas. So let's define an array to hold these columns. And to draw these columns, we're gonna use a spacing. So basically the space we allow each column to be drawn in. I'm gonna define this spacing equal to the width of the canvas divided by n. So each column has an nth uh, part of the canvas available. Now drawing on the canvas is done with the canvas context object. I'm gonna get a reference to it like this. And let's display all of the values of the array on the canvas at the different locations. I'm going to define here the X and Y location of a column to be the center of the bottom of the column itself. So let's set X equal to I times spacing plus half the space. So we want them to be in the middle of each available space. And the Y value is just going to be equal to the canvas height for now then the width of the column is going to be equal to the spacing for now and the height is going to be equal to the height of the canvas multiplied by the fractional value that we generated randomly in the beginning. So at the moment I'm just going to draw these columns as vertical bars just to see if this works. I'm gonna define the column using an object that we need to create, this column object, we'll create it in just a second, using this x, y, width and height values that we pass to the constructor. And then these are going to also have a draw method that can be drawn 
on the canvas like this. Let me save this file and now go in index.html and include a new file for the column object. So this is something that we need to create here, column.js. And inside of this column, we will define our column class. I will write here class column and the constructor that takes x, y, the width and the height like this. And I'll set these values um, like so, the attributes of this object with this x, this y, this width and this height. So the object will remember these values that were passed to the constructor. And the draw method is going to take the context as the parameter. And I'm just going to define two helper variables here, one for the left and one for the top, which is easy to get. We just get the x minus half the width. And the top is going to be the y minus uh, this height. So we need these because we begin a path and now we're going to call this rect method which accepts four arguments. The value for the top left corner, so left on the x, top on the y, and then this width, this height. I didn't want to write here these complicated equations, so that's why I needed these left and top. I think it makes the code look much, much clearer in this way. And let's just fill with the default fill color, which is black. Now save the file, refresh the page, and we get this uh, vertical bars similar as in my other sorting visualizer where we used divs instead. But uh, I want them to be aligned to center, so let's change the body to have a display of flex, a flex direction set to column, and align items to center. I think this looks good. I'm going to copy this inside of our style CSS and give it to the body tag. So refreshing the page now, we get this. Now, the reason we are using canvas this time is because I want to style these bars to look like actual columns. And I do this better in the canvas. It's just a matter of preference. You could do this in CSS as well, but I think the canvas gives you a little more freedom. And there's an animation technique I want to teach you in this video that works on the canvas. So I'm going to stick with it. Now, let's make these look like actual columns. I'm going to delete this part and define another helper variable here. I will say right. I also want to know what is the right side of the column. Very easily, just the x plus the width divided by 2, like this. And now let's begin the path. And I'm going to fill this with the gray color. So I will write fill style is equal to RGB 150, 150. 150, like this, and I'm going to move in the top left corner according to our left and top helper variables. And I'm just going to do a line to left and this y value, which is actually the bottom. I don't need to define a new helper variable for bottom because I know the x and y are at the bottom. And this is just the line on the left. So at the bottom, I want to draw half of an ellipse. And I do this by writing ellipse with this x and y. So this is the center of the ellipse. And the radius on x is going to be width divided by 2. And I also want to have a radius on y, which is going to be smaller. I'm going to set this to a width divided by 4. If I would set it to the same, then it would just draw a circle there. But I wanted to have a little bit of a perspective view. So a few more parameters needed here. I'm going to set 0 for rotation. And then I want just half of the ellipse. So going from math pi to math pi times 2. And the last value here, true, means that we want to go counterclockwise when we draw this ellipse. Now, 
we continue the drawing with another vertical line to the right top point. And then we draw another ellipse, but we're going to have a full one this time. So we begin this ellipse in the center top with the same values for width and height as above and also zero rotation. But here we are going to draw a full ellipse. So from zero to math pi times two. And now we fill using this gray color we defined earlier and we stroke with the default black color. So refresh the page and it's fine, but I would like to see the bottom part of these columns as well. And some of the top parts are being cut off. So we definitely need a kind of margin here. I also want to control the size of the canvas. So let's set here the canvas size so that its width is say 400 pixels, 300 pixels height. So a little bit larger this time. And this margin, let's set it to 30 pixels. Now this spacing is going to change so that we subtract here the margin times two. We want the horizontal spacing to be that of the available space. And every time we set the value for X here, we account for this margin on the left as well. And at the bottom as well, like this. The height here needs to also consider the size of the margin, both at the top and at the bottom, so I'm going to multiply it by two. And now if we refresh the page, we get this. If I'm going to highlight the canvas, you see that there is a nice margin all around it. We also see the bottom of these bars and they're not getting cut off at the top anymore. But I would like to have a little bit of spacing between these columns. So I'm going to subtract here four for this width. And now I can see the columns a little better. And actually I would like to have the maximum height of the columns defined by another constant. So let's say here max column height set to 200. And here I'm going to use this value instead. So now they are covering the bottom part of the canvas with some room to spare here at the top. And that's because I would like to adjust the Y value so that it looks a little bit like a 3D perspective. Here, where we are defining the Y, I'm going to subtract I times three. Maybe I should define some constants for these values, but I can't think of any right now and I think it's overkill. So let's refresh this and now we see these columns with a little bit of a perspective view. Now, when we animate this effect, I want the columns to move from one location to another by animation, not just instantly swapping locations like what we did in the simpler visualizer. So for that, I'm going to set up an animation loop and then handle the moves somehow on top of it. Let's remove this drawing from here because the animation is going to handle the drawing. And I'm going to go down here and say animate. And in this animate function, we will begin with clearing the canvas. So from the top left corner of zero, zero to the bottom right corner of the canvas. And now I'm going to draw all of the columns that are stored in this calls global variable. We'll draw these on the context as before. And then I will call this request animation frame that will repeat this animate function many times per second. It will try to do it 60 times per second, depending on how busy the processor is. Let's save this file, refresh the page, and nothing looks really different. But now we get this uh, displaying of the columns many, many times per second, waiting for our animations to happen. 
And instead of having one animation loop per object, like some techniques use, we are going to have this one single animation loop here on the mainframe. And then the objects themselves will generate the in-between frames of each move and retrieve them from a queue. I'll show you. So here inside of column.js, I'm going to go at the top and define a queue of frames of how this object is going to be. At the moment, I'm just going to animate the X and Y, but we'll see later, we can change other properties as well. And now I'm going to add here a method called move to a given location. So from the current location, move to a new location and with the frame count set to 100 by default. So this move is going to consist of 100 frames. And here I'm going to generate all the in-between locations using linear interpolation. So I'm going to go here and get a value for t as a fraction between 0 and 1 depending on this i value. I just divide here by the frame count like this. And I'm going to add to the queue a new object where we interpolate between the current x and y location and the one coming from this location, this lock parameter. So x is going to be lerp like this and y is going to be lerp like this. If you're not familiar with how linear interpolation works, then check out my video on linear interpolation. It's not very complicated, but there I explain it very much in depth and I show a bunch of different applications. Here I'm just going to go inside of the draw method and write here a piece of code that checks if this queue is not empty. And if it's not empty, we are going to get the x and y value of the first element in the queue, like this, and assign this x and this y to those values. So essentially the draw method is responsible for iterating through these frames. Now save this file and I'm going to implement quickly this lerp function. Let me go inside of index.html and create a separate file for that. Let's call this math.js. Create this file and the lerp function is really easy. I just take the values from A to B so that we start with A and then we add the difference from B to A multiplied by this fractional value. Save the file, refresh the page and nothing happens but for each of the columns we have access to their move method. So in the console here I'm going to take the first column for example and write move to, and let's just give some location in the scene. Maybe something like an X of 300 and a Y of, I don't know, 200, like this. And you can see that column moving from its original location to this location that I gave right here. If I wanted to go more to the top, I can now say go to 100 and it's going to go upwards because it's getting in between frames in its queue. So I just need to tell the column where to go and it knows to generate those frames by itself, displace those frames one by one when we call the draw method. And because of the way we have this implemented, we can even put here another column like calls of this was zero, so one, two, three, four, five. Let's move it over this one right here, actually behind this column, it's going to appear. If we write here calls of five like this, it's going to go exactly where that column is because all columns have an X and Y attribute. Now, if we would set here a different kind of frame count, for example, hmm, I don't know, 
40. Then the column is going to go there much faster. And if we are going to set a frame count that is larger, like 400, now the column is going to move much slower. So we can control the pace of our animation using that, but I'm happy with uh, the current value that we have at the moment. Now, these moves are going to come from somewhere, and that's going to be the bubble sort algorithm. So I'm going to go down here and implement bubble sort pretty much the same way as it's written on the Wikipedia page. So given an array, I'm going to iterate while it's swapped and go through all of its elements except the first one, so starting at the second one. And I compare the previous element, that's why we need to start here at one, otherwise there wouldn't be a previous element and we get an error. If that element, the previous one, is greater than the one we're currently at, then we are going to swap that. And I'm also going to mark there that a swap did happen during this phase. I swap these using this destructuring assignment and right here I'm going to repeat while this swapped um, says true. So if we're going to iterate through this and we never find a situation where we need the swap, then this stays to false and this loop will terminate. Now, as we did in the other tutorial, the simpler visualizer, I'm going to log all of these moves when they happen. So I'm going to go up here like this and say moves is equal to an empty array. And now here, I'm going to record this move by storing here the indices that form the move. So I want to store that something happened between the i minus one and i index. And I want to say that it was indeed a swap, setting here the swap attribute to true. But I also want to store the move of uh, non-swap, so to speak. So here I'm going to set the same indices with a swap set to false, because the comparison itself is a move, part of the algorithm, and I want to visualize that as well. Now, I return here these moves, and we are done with this bubble sort implementation. It's pretty much the straightforward implementation, but with recording these moves, saying if it's a swap or not a swap, just a comparison. Now, above animate right here, I'm going to get the moves necessary to swap this array like this. It's going to be a global variable. And if we refresh the page, I can actually type here moves. And we will see that there will be a number of 342 moves required to sort this array. And each of these moves have a pair of indices, and it's going to say if it is a swap or if it's just a comparison. And the indices are going to be written right here. So for example, the 15th move here is going to be a swap between indices 15 and 16. It's a swap because this is true. So now we can go in our animate function right here and check to see if we need to do any moves. So I'm going to see if the moves array has some elements in it. And if so, let's get the first move using the array shift method like this. And now I'm just going to get the i and j indices from this move for a quick use right here. I don't want to write everywhere move.indices and then the first or the second element. And if the move is a swap, then I'm going to tell those columns, so the column of i, move to the column of j. And vice versa, I'm going to visually swap those columns 
by animating them to each other's locations. I also want to swap the columns themselves so that I know that the first column, the one that is animating to the second position, is not anymore that column. It's going to be a reference to a different object now after the swap. So I do it like this. Otherwise, I'm also going to animate the comparisons in some way. But uh, at the moment, I'm just going to write here to do and focus on these swap moves to begin with. Let's save this file, refresh the page, and some very, very strange thing is happening. And that's because we are animating these moves one after the other on consecutive frames before the previous move has a chance to finish. So very strange stuff is happening right now and uh, we don't want that. So what we are going to do is find a way to detect if a column is currently busy, if it's changing, if it's moving, if it's doing something, it has frames in its queue, then we don't move to the next move yet. We do that by going here in the column class and I will update the draw method to tell us if it changed something or not. So we say here, let changed is equal to false. But if we were processing this queue, then I'm going to set this change to true. And the draw method is going to return if it changed or not. Then here, where we are doing the drawing of all the columns, even if a single column has changed, we don't move to the next move just yet. So I'm going to check for any change like this. Changed is equal to false. And here we will set the value of changed is equal to whatever the draw returns from here or the previous value of changed. So even if a single thing is going to change, a column is on its way to the proper destination, then this value will be a true at the end of it. And this if condition, of course, it's going to still check if there are moves to animate, but also if there are no changes detected. So both of these conditions have to be met. And now if we refresh this, we see <laughs> this tall column slowly going to the end location because that's how bubble sort works. So each of the neighboring columns here are checked and this just happened to be a very large one to begin with. And this is now the first phase of the animation. And then it moves to the next one. And this might take a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to wait for that. So let's go to the columns here and just set that this frame count is going to be faster. Something like maybe 20 frames. Looks much better, I, I think. I'm patient enough to wait for this. Now, when swapping columns, I actually want one of them to go in front of the other. And because of this false perspective that we have here, that means that the columns should go one a little bit lower and the other a little bit higher. And um, I'm going to use the sign function for that. Hope this will be clear. So I'm going to define here a u constant equal to math.sign of this t value that is going to be between 0 and 1. But I'm going to multiply this by pi. And the reason for this is that I want this u to change from 0 to 1 and back to 0 when this t has reached 1. And that's how the sine function looks like. I recommend you look up the Desmos calculator and try this function out if your math is a bit rusty. But I'm just going to go with this. And here I'm going to add this value 
to the y value, like this, multiplied by some kind of constant. I'm just going to use here this width divided by 4, which we used when defining the ellipse. If I don't multiply by anything here, then this change is going to be between 0 and 1 pixel, so barely noticeable. And now when we refresh this, we see in those columns, both of them go downwards a little bit. Let me make this a little bit more noticeable. I think we can, yeah, I think this looks much better. So one of the columns should actually go in the back. And I'm going to mark this with a parameter here called y offset. If we want this to be a positive one or a negative one, and I'm just going to set this equal to one and multiply it by this y offset right here. Nothing changes at the moment because this is one and I'm just multiplying by one here. But if I'm going to call this move to with a minus one as the second parameter, then that one is going to be in the opposite direction. So here in the script where I'm calling these things, I'm just going to set a minus one for this column right here. And when I refresh, we see those columns kind of swapping uh, by rotating around their center of mass if they would weigh the same, which probably they don't. So not a good explanation, but hopefully you know what I mean. Okay, great. So what I want to do next is add a little bit of control to this uh, buttons to start and stop these animations. So I'm going to go into index HTML right here. And I'm going to write a separator. And in a div, I will define two buttons with an on click of init and another button with an on click of play. This will start the animation. The other one will generate a new array like this. And now in script.js, we are going to refactor things a little bit. So our init function is right here, is going to populate this array. And I'm also going to set the moves here back to empty. Because if we want to stop a previously running animation, then that's the way to do it. Now, these moves here, I'm going to remove and add them here at the top. So as an empty array, and our play function is going to generate those. So function play is going to set those moves this should be a let, otherwise I can't modify them, is equal to bubble sort of our array, like this. Our init is also going to be responsible for creating these columns, like so. And of course, all these global values need to be above everything else. So I'm going to move them here at the top. Right, now if I refresh init and play, these seem to work. If I init again and then I play, the animation starts. If I would press play again, then the animation actually stops because the array in memory has sorted from the previous time I pressed play. And then the new moves to sort it are going to be empty. So if you want your interface to be more consistent, then you should do something about that. I'll let you figure it out. But uh, so far, I'm quite happy with this. I just want to call in it right here so that I don't need to press it uh, each time. And uh, now I'm going to focus a little bit on the other animation. So when we compare two columns, I want them to jump up a little bit. And that happens 
right here where we wrote our to do. So I'm going to say here columns of i dot jump and the same for columns of j and inside of column js I'm going to define a new method which is going to be called jump. So this jump method is going to have a frame count like this and uh, I'm going to do the same approach as before. I'm going to iterate through this frame count, get the value of t, get the value for t, a value for u, and add to the queue the same x in between these two locations. It's not going to change the x location, it's just going to modify its y location in this way. And I'm using here the width to be a more significant bounce. Right, now if I'm going to save this and refresh, play. Okay, mm. no bounces yet. Looks like we might have to wait a while because this array needs <laughs> a lot of swaps happening all the time. Okay, yeah, there are bounces happening at the end here. Yeah, okay, now we can see these bounces sometimes. Okay, nice. I want to add sound here as well. I'm going to go to script.js. And uh, at the top here, I will initialize an audio context to null. And I'm going to make a function for playing a note at a given frequency. Now, this function will check if the audio context is initialized or not. And if it's not, it's going to initialize it like this. And it's a little ugly because this audio context is sometimes appearing differently in different browsers, but this is the best way I know how to do it for maximum compatibility. Now, the duration of this note is going to be quite short. It's going to be like 0.2 of a second. And we are going to use an oscillator to create a noise, a tune with a given frequency. Now, the value for this frequency comes from this parameter up here, and I'm just going to tell this to start as so, and to stop after the duration. Because I want to avoid the clicking noise I mentioned in the other tutorial with the simpler visualizer, I'm going to already write here a uh, gain node that will start with a value of 0 0.4 this time and I'm going to change the value of this gain towards 0 by the time the duration has ended. So this function is doing linear interpolation between the current value of 0.4 and 0 throughout the duration right here. I'm not going in depth here. If you want to learn more about this audio context, uh, this web audio API, then check out my visual web development course or this Melody Maker uh, tutorial. I think I explain it okay in that one too. So now we connect the oscillator to the node and the node to the destination, which is the speakers. Let's call this. lay note function right here with the frequency equal to let's try the sum of the heights of the two columns so columns of i dot height plus columns of j dot height like this now we save the file refresh the page 
press play, Okay, it's kind of nice, but I would like the sound to sound differently when it's bouncing and when it's doing the swap. And one thing that you can do here is change the waveform shape from the sign, which is the default shape, into a sawtooth or triangle or, or square. And I think that I'm going to do that here by specifying the type in a second parameter to display note. So I'm going to put the type um, like so. Equal to, I'm going to check the move. If it's a swap, the move is gonna be a square. Otherwise, I just use the sign, which is the default. And this waveform type is gonna go here as a second parameter. So our play note function also needs a type here. And I'm going to set the oscillator type is equal to this given type. Refresh this, play. So you can hear a little bit differently how it sounds when they swap a little bit stronger and then a little bit softer when they bounce. And I'm happy with this. I'm still gonna fine tune things a little bit and change the color of these columns somehow. So here at the top, I'm going to define a color attribute for this column. I will say this dot color is equal to and R value of 150, green value of 150, blue value of 150. So these are the same values that we had here at the bottom when drawing the column. And here I'm going to say, let's extract these RGB values from this color and replace this with a template literal so that we can write instead of these values, the values of this RGB instead. So I want to change these values somehow. Now, here what I'm doing is this destructuring assignment to an object and I'm essentially accessing these variables after this is happening. It makes me write a little bit cleaner code. Now, in the move to here, once I have this u value, I'm going to add three more things to this queue. A value for r, which is linear interpolation between 150 to 255 using u. So I want our columns to increase in redness depending on u. And also a similar thing happening for the green and blue, but I want those to decrease in green and blue. So I want them to really become red when U is maximum. Now, when drawing these right here, I'm going to also extract the R, G and blue values from the Q. And I will set this color is equal to R, G, B, like so. If I refresh and play, we see now the columns changing to red when they are active, so to speak. And I also want to emphasize them during the jump. 
I'm going to copy this part from here, also here. And all of these will turn to black during the jump. So Yeah, black is too much. I think 100 is better. So it's going to be a darker gray. Yeah, I'm happy with this. Let me know in the comments what you think and see you guys.